I would like to welcome you all uh, to today's AHN Fireside Chat and today's series number uh, 104. My name is Dr. Igina Francis Makwabe. I'm the physician and consultant nephrologist working with Africa Healthcare Network in Tanzania. I'll be chairing this session uh, together with uh, Dr. Marin, who is a consultant physician uh, working with Africa Healthcare Network in Kenya. So uh, I would like to welcome you all. And today's topic is very interesting. Uh, it is uh, the, um, the, the use of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning in nephrology. So this is a very interesting topic. And today, uh, today's speaker is Professor Katanko, Kotanko, who is not new. Uh, he presented uh, in, in July this year, uh, the topic was um, Mondo initiatives, uh, monitoring uh, dialysis outcomes. So that was a very interesting topic in July. So today we are lucky that he's with us again with the use of artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning in nephrology. This is a very interesting topic. Uh, Professor Peter Kotanko is the uh, MD in research uh, director of the Reno Research Institute, RRI, uh, New York. Prior to joining RRI from 1997 to 2007, he served as vice chair of Department of Internal Medicine uh, at an academic teaching hospital in Graz, Austria. Prior to moving to Graz in 1989, he worked from 1982 to 1989 at the Department of Physiology and the, uh, and the University Clinic of Internal Medicine, Innsbruck, Austria. From 1995 to 1996, he trained in nephrology at the Hammersmith Hospital, London, UK. He's adjunct professor of medicine and nephrology at the ICA School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, in New York and holds a teaching appointment at the University of Innsbruck. He has authored and co-authored over 300 papers and book chapters. He's our D of the 2019 and 2021 Kidnex Prize of for Innovation. Uncle, you are warmly welcome and please proceed with the presentation. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you really for this kind introduction also. Uh, for the uh, invitation to talk about this topic. But before I start, uh, you mentioned Mondo earlier, and I really have to compliment uh, Lloyd, who gave such an outstanding presentation at the Mondo meeting um, at the ASN about, um, about the African Healthcare Network. And it was received with, uh, with great uh, interest and I think Lloyd, please uh, weigh in here, but I think it was there were very interesting uh, questions and it was a good discussion ensued. So, so I think this was a very successful presentation by Lloyd and, and um, in my conversations with them, other Mondo members after, after the session, um, there is, there is uh, a great enthusiasm that the African Healthcare Network may, may join Mondo. I mean, it will take a few, uh, quite a while, you know, to go at uh, all the administrative aspects, legal compliance, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, where, where there is a will, there is a way. That's uh, at least my position and uh, I'm sure we'll get this done. Thank you, Peter. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much. It was wonderful, actually. Uh, uh, really good gathering and wonderful topics discussed. So thank you so much. Okay, no, thank you. Let me now share my screen. So, so the topic is artificial intelligence and machine learn in learning and deep learning in nephrology. And um, let me start by sharing with you my disclosures. I'm an employee of the Research Institute, a wholly owned subsidiary of Frisase Medical Care, I'm stock in FMC. I receive author royalties from up to date and HS talks. I'm editor, uh, editorial board of several kidney journals. I invent on multiple patents in the in the kidney space. Now, <clears throat> when, when you when you hear the word artificial intelligence, what are you actually thinking of? And and um, and I mean, 
most people think of digital assistants like Alexa, or Siri, or driverless cars, voice recognition, chat boots, or surveillance system, robots, fraud detection, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are already, as we speak, many, many applications of artificial intelligence uh, around us. Now, obviously, there's also the notion that um, data is the new oil, and the question is really how to put this data at, uh, at really good, good use. Now, the, the amount of data uh, has grown really exponentially over the years. So one of the questions is really how to make sense of them. I mean, there, and one way to, to deal with those data, and I said, I'm, um, I'm not saying it's the only one, it's the use of artificial intelligence tools. And the reason being that uh, AI applications really require and, and love huge data sets. And this is one of the reasons why AI is so much on the rise, I think. Now, when you look into publications on AI in medicine, just here, it, this goes only up to 2017, you see that the number of publications have re risen exponentially uh, over the years. And uh, with uh, kidney, somewhere I would say in the, in the upper third of this, uh, of this list. So we are not on the top, but also not really on the, on the bottom of this. It's, I think, always interesting to look, uh, to take a little bit a look into the history. And uh, it was really in 1957 at, uh, at what was called the Dartmouth Summer Research Project, where uh, a group of um, avant-garde experts uh, from very different areas, mathematicians, engineers, um, primarily came together at, um, uh, at a, uh, over, over the course of seven weeks to discuss um, what, how could we design machines that could learn. Um, and maybe there were, uh, and they were discussing, maybe there's even a way to develop something like a non-human and artificial intelligence. And uh, you see the people here uh, on the right in 1956 and in 2006. And this was really the, the Startmouth uh, Summer Research Project what is deemed by most as the starting point of artificial intelligence. Now, uh, as said, the goal was really to develop something that uh, is some non-human kind of intelligence, but still um, the researchers uh, took um, an example from biology. And as you can see in, in figure A, of course, they looked at, um, at the human or shall I say at the biological uh, structure of, uh, of neuron cells and of the organization of the brain. And as you know, of course, uh, uh, neurons, they have the cell body and dendrites and axons, terminal axon. And they would develop something like an artificial neuron with multiple inputs like the dendrites and one output like the, the axon. And in the center of this neuron, there is a mathematical operations go on that integrate these many inputs through some um, yeah, computational process. Now, as you, that's shown in, in B. In C, it's shown that of course a neuron doesn't live by itself, right? It's connected to other neurons. And, and this was also taken as an example uh, to construct artificial neural networks where multiple uh, neurons are connected. And in many of the current uh, artificial neural networks, you have an input layer. This input layer is connected with multiple uh, one or, or, or more hidden layers. These are shown here in gray, and these are connected to an output layer. And then mathematically heavy lifting, so to speak, takes place in these, uh, in these hidden layers. Now, it, uh, and just um, 
for the for the geeks among uh, you, for those who are really interested, what was really a breakthrough uh, was uh, the solution to the so-called XOR problem. Um, and to me, I, I show this slide because to me it's so interesting that solving a, a, a small problem, and then not a small problem, that solving something, a problem that may look highly theoretical, really uh, can advance the field hugely. So it's, you see the, the XOR truth table on the left, and what was discovered is actually we need hidden layers, a hidden layer to solve that logical problem. And once this was clear, the, the floodgates would open, so to speak, and would allow for the development of highly complex network structures that, uh, that are now currently used in, um, in, in many fields of our life. Now, uh, just a few definitions. I mean, first, it's important to understand that there is no universal definition of artificial intelligence. Uh, it's... Um, it most agree that it's the ability of a machine system to learn. Machine learning subdiscipline of AI. It studies algorithms and statistical methods that use pattern and uh, pattern recognition and deep learning. It's a subfield of machine learning and it uses, it builds on highly, highly complex artificial neural networks, much more complex than, you know, the ones you see here on the, on the bottom right with, say, two hidden layers. Now, the question is, of course, what is AI very good at? Well, AI is very good at um, identifying patterns through an associative process, such as uh, image analysis. Uh, this is uh, done sometimes through what's called supervised learning. So in other words, you know, an input, you know, an output, and then the AI, the machine learning algorithm creates a correlation between the input and the output. AI is also very good in examining huge data sets for hidden structures, including high dimensional and nonlinear structures. And, and so they, you have an input, but no output that's predefined and the AI system uh, identify structures in those data sets that's called unsupervised learning. AI is also very good in playing games with well-defined rules such as chess or Go. Now, another question is, of course, what is AI not so good at? It's always important when you deal with methods to know the limitations of the method. AI is not good at all in providing mechanistic or causal explanations. It's not good at predicting phase shifts. And I'll say in a second what phase shifts are. It's, uh, it's not good at interpreting patterns without historical examples. And actually, it's not good in avoiding biases. Uh, so there is the danger that, um, that uh, biases, man-made biases, may creep into AI system. It's actually a huge danger. Um, and, and people become more and more aware of that. So in a way, uh, and maybe it's a little bit exaggerated, but that's how I think about it. Uh, AI, AI is locked into the current domain of knowledge and it's not very good in, in reaching out to the unknown to identify these phase shifts. So what do I mean with phase shift? Um, say, uh, on the, uh, you see on the, top hand, you see this horse and carriage, right? And let's, in a thought experiment, let's think about um, neural networks that know everything about horse and carriages as means of transportation. I bet to say, I maintain to say that uh, such a neural network would not have been able to predict an entirely new mode of motion, cars because it's not embedded in the previous, in the previous way of uh, transportation. Or another example, uh, neural networks could know everything about lightning through candles. It would not have been able to, uh, to really predict uh, light bulbs because that's out of the domain. So that's what, what I mean with, uh, with phase shifts. 
I think that these phase shifts require and will continue to require uh, profound human insights and human uh, creativity. Now, uh, there is also a number of real world data science problems. So when you look at the left, you, you see these uh, cute dogs, the golden doodles, but to some neural networks, they just look like fried chicken, right? So they, they have trouble separating them or the chihuahuas on the right side. They just look like, may look like blueberry muffins. So, so you see that there, there is real problems and we just have to be uh, aware of these uh, problems um, and we must not jump onto AI solutions as the, as the savior in all situations. We must be very critical and careful here. Now, uh, again, I just, uh, we briefly wrote about this, what, what is AI deep learning? Now, obviously, AI needs a whole range of experts. And this is something I really would want you to take with you. Uh, AI needs what's called a domain expert. The domain expert, and this in the field of medicine, this is you, it's you defines the goal and helps other team members to understand the elements of the real life question. So, so this is very, very important to me. Uh, so it's, it actually, I mean to empower the, the medical community to take on this role. We mustn't leave this role to all the other fields, the data scientists, data engineers, statisticians, mathematicians, of course, uh, they, they are, essential to make AI systems work, but they are, in my mind, real enabler. It's, it's us as the physicians to define the goals. So I think that's, that's really important to, to, to understand here. Now, AI systems um, use many, many sorts of data inputs. I just summarized them here briefly, like electronic health, starting from the top right, left, electronic health records, notes. I mean, the good thing is they are readily available. And in italic below, there are concerns like uh, protected health information, or dialysis machine data, very rich, but you need a very mature IT uh, uh, infrastructure or medical images, difficult workflow integration, or wearable devices like uh, Apple Watch, Fitbits, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then they can be used really for patients' uh, symptoms, for diagnosis, prognosis, and prediction or treatment recommendations. So these are, are, are some of the examples of data sources and application of AI machine learning in dialysis specifically. Now, <clears throat> speaking of here on the bottom left, you see the variable devices. Um, we, we thought a little bit more about this and, and published this, um, in uh, a few years ago about the potential relevance of variable devices in the care of uh, hemodialysis patients. And we have ongoing studies to really explore that in greater detail. Because variable devices, I mean, they will become more and more relevant uh, in, in the next uh, decade or so. And, and they provide extremely important information, specifically, of course, in our patients about the inter interval. And, uh, and we just must keep an open eye here. Now, uh, let me give you a few examples. This is Han Zhi Sheng, um, a colleague of mine and a statistician and AI expert. And, um, and she was working on the classification of arterial venous aneurysms um, using AI and, I mean, Obviously, to you, which of these ADF aneurysms is most worrisome? Obviously, it's the one in the in the center at the bottom with this uh, with this ulcerization here. So the question is, I mean, every year uh, we in our network uh, lose patients because they just bleed to death with aneurysm ruptures, and and the question was, can we detect those ruptures? Uh, use through image analysis. So what we did was really we uh, we asked staff to take pictures of uh, AV fistulas, and then these pictures 
are sent to the cloud and undergo some uh, analysis using deep learning. And you see there is many, many, many hidden layers here to classify those aneurysm stages. And, uh, and uh, the, the system is extremely good. I mean, you see an area under the receiver operating characteristics curve of 0.96. So the, the uh, network can almost, with almost perfect uh, sensitivity and specificity discern uh, advanced from um, from not advanced uh, aneurysms. This is something AI is really good at, right? Uh, <clears throat> we also use AI as um, an application of AI is what's called natural language processing. And this is work uh, done together with Lily Chan from Mount Sinai Hospital, where we used NLP, that's language processing, to uh, to identify patient symptoms based off uh, nursing notes. And it turned out that uh, actually NLP is better than the ICD billing codes uh, than in identifying patient symptoms. Of course, we uh, when the uh, pandemic struck, um, we also used uh, machine learning to identify patients uh, hemodialysis patients with uh, undetected SARS-CoV-2 infection. And again, uh, and this was integrated in our workflow and uh, Caitlin Morgan uh, did, this, uh, did this research. Um, another, another application of AI is to predict intratolytic hypotension at the time in 12, 15 to 75 minutes in advance. So, um, I mean, just to walk you through this, so we, we, we studied almost 700 patients with uh, over 40,000 dialysis patients and, and trained a, a neural network to predict the intratolytic hypertension. And you see the predicted probability and the observed rate of IDH, they were, they were almost exactly the same and, and again, a very good area under the curve. So, so this is something AI can really deliver. Uh, obviously, AI needs input, and what are the most important input data? It's like most recent blood pressure, IDH rate of 10 last treatments, and so on. So it all makes sense. I was a little bit surprised to see blood flow rate, to be honest here. But um, yeah, that's what we found. And, and we are, of course, looking into this, and, uh, and we have currently a manuscript under review. Um, another area. I mean, we use this um, this what's called gridline device in in many of our patients. That's a device that measures automatically uh, hematocrit and oxygen saturation. And now look at the throughout the treatment. And now look at the top panel here, just then panel A. And you see here over time, treatment time in hours at the bottom, you see there are arterial oxygen saturation. And you see they are very stable here, right? I hope you can see my point up. And they are very stable here. And when you zoom in over a period of five minutes, you see they are just stable. But but there are other patients who suddenly start to, where suddenly the oxygen saturation starts to oscillate. And when you dial in here, uh, the zoom in here, I should say, you see these sort of swings of oxygen saturation. And this is very interesting. And we explore this in some greater detail. And we think it's actually um, associated with sleep apnea or sleep associated breathing disorder. Now, in, uh, in order to identify those in millions of treatments, we had to develop a method. And this method is also uh, AI based. Remember, we just published this a few weeks ago. And then you, you can see here, I mean, where, where AI system clearly identifies those oscillations. You may say, oh yeah, well, obviously, that's not difficult, right? Yes, it's not difficult for us humans, but it's actually very difficult or not so easy to identify these things through a machine, right? So, so that's the point here. Now, the anemia control modular ACM, that's one of the few AI application that really made it to clinical application. And um, 
from Carlos Barbieri published this in about six years ago now. And he's showed here, and you see hemoglobin standard deviation. It was improved uh, in patients treated with this um, with this ACM, and also uh, so so this was uh, this was actually quite quite interesting. And the ACM is now used in a number of um, of dialysis facilities, specifically in Europe and in Asia Pacific, and I believe also in Australia. Now. <clears throat> Prognosis. Uh, I mean, among the the since ancient times, as physicians, patients ask us for a few things, right? It's diagnosis, prognosis, and therapy. These are really the the key responsibilities of physicians, and uh, and AI systems can help us also with prognosis, and. And it's a little bit different now in the 21st century because we have so much more data available uh, for um, for prognosis and a new uh, a new field. I think virtual medicine or computational medicine is is um, is developing here, and there's actually very interesting developments. And and um, a few hours ago, I attended. Um, a talk by a colleague of mine about computational medicine was, which was fascinating to see how the application of mathematics can really improve uh, medical care on a large scale. Now, when it comes to predictive analytics, the process is, I, I think there's a fundamental process and it starts with the use of historical data, a predictive algorithm is developed and then model is, uh, a model is designed then uh, this model is uh, fed with new data and it makes predictions, right? That's the, the fundamental process, I would say. Now, there is a number of methods and machine learning methods and no need to go into, into these in any detail. Just uh, suffice to say that there is a, a large number of various methods and, and we and others, of course, use these methods um, the, as, as appropriate. Now, <clears throat> one of the first, one of the first um, use cases was to predict mortality. Now, uh, in Dallas, of course, as you know, they have a high mortality rate. In the last months before death, they are characterized by very typical changes, right? And, uh, and the goal is really to uh, timely, uh, initiate diagnostic and therapeutic intervention and prepare for supportive and palliative care. And um, in 2016, out of the KDAIGO conference, there came a very clear call. Uh, it's time to change our prognostic tools and they're using CKD. And, and what we did in this paper here was really to put together some of the uh, parameters that can be helpful really to predict, uh, to predict, uh, or to, to, to assist with prognosis. Um, as I said earlier, um, as I said earlier, there is a very typical change of, of certain parameters before death. And this, this was, by the way, one of the first uh, Mondo uh, publications. Um, this first author. And what we found here, and just look on the bottom right, you see at the weeks before death at the bottom, an albumin level on the on the y-axis. And you see that in patients in Asia, Europe, South America, North America, the 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 albumin changes in a very typical way, right? And the same is true for other parameters. So so what we learned here, there is actually apparently a, a fundamental underlying biological characteristic before death that starts weeks and many weeks actually before patient decline. The same is true for say um, body weight, right? Where you see that in the 24 months before death, uh, the starts declining body weight by uh, eventually up to five kilograms or hospitalization rate changes and so on. So the question was, how good are you in predicting mortality? And what we did 
was a head-to-head -head comparison of mortality prediction by physicians and statistical models. So we, we uh, te uh, 10 nephrologists from five RRI hemodialysis clinics volunteered to be part of this, of this prospective study. And, um, and the nephrologists were asked what's called the surprise question. Question is, would you be surprised if your patient is still alive in six or in 12 months? And the, the nephrologists uh, answered this question and, and documented their response, right? And, they, and this response was sealed. And then we uh, just waited, right? And, uh, and we, also gener we also created a prediction model that would predict uh, patients' mortality. And, uh, and after, after uh, one year was over, we analyzed the data. It's a little bit complicated here. And actually, maybe I shouldn't go into all the details. Maybe I shouldn't go into, into all the details here. Suffice to say that out of these 10 patients, there was, uh, out of these 10 nephrologists, there were, uh, three that were better than, uh, than the, the, our prediction model in predicting six months mortality. And there was one, only one out of these uh, 10 physicians who was better than the prediction model to predict 12 months mortality. So, so I think it, uh, it really shows the power of such prediction models. And, um, and, uh, and I think it's also important to have these sort of head-to-head -head comparisons and, and uh, both sensitivity and specificity of the prediction model was superior to the physicians. Now, <clears throat> another important question is of course, prediction of hospitalization. So uh, we, uh, when, when you look at the, uh, and this is old data, old internal data, but uh, I think in, in general it's still, Maybe still true. It's still true, I would think, that um, there is a number of patients, 40% or so, that don't get hospitalized uh, in, in a specific year. And then this is this so called fat tail or almost log normal distribution. And about 15% um, of patients have six or more hospitalizations per year. And it's those patients who need very special attention because they, I mean, it would make, because they also are heavily, heavy resource utilizers. And so, uh, so we focused on, on these patients. And again, um, as Len Usiat has shown in a, in a paper published uh, eight years ago, that there is very typical changes before patients get hospitalized. And so based on this, we built, a, uh, we built a prediction model. And what we found is actually most hospitalizations are predictable. So what we did was to, uh, to use data from some over 140,000 patients. Uh, we started with um, initially with almost 100 variables, traditional and more untraditional ones. And the prediction was hospitalization in the following year. Right. And we use several traditional machine learning techniques. Eventually, we boiled down to 30, about 30 predictors. And what we found actually, that uh, the best models had an error under the curve of about 90%. Uh, so, so we are pretty good in identifying those patients at high risk for hospitalization. And these patients were then, uh, specifically taken care of. But how does AI support the prediction actually provide actionable information, right? That's important. Prediction is one thing, but you need to act on it. So what we did was to put a specific process in place. <clears throat> so we had the, the, we created this prediction here on the left side, based on the data in the AI system. We these uh, predictions were communicated to what we call care coordination units. Uh, that's usually uh, nursing staff. They would uh, connect with the clinic 
and the clinic would uh, would define interventions. <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> now, um, a question I was frequently asked, uh, oh, Peter, what kind of intervention shall we take? And my response was always just to good medicine. Speak to the patient, look at the patient and take it from there. So I, I'm very old fashioned. I think that the clinical evaluation of a patient is, is key. It's central to everything we are doing. So take a history and then physical exam. I mean, lab studies, of course, also important imaging study, but the, uh, but the clinical evaluation is just paramount. So, and therapeutic intervention, well, it follows based on, on what the uh, what the clinical uh, evaluation, et cetera, brings, right? What was most interesting, most interesting in a pilot we ran at RRI that, uh, in a pilot that we ran at the RI clinics, that most problems were, were not problems that require big medicine, you know. They were mostly social psychological issues, or psychosocial issues, I should say, non-adherence, fluid overload, uh, and, and these kind of things. So, so it's the most intervention, most of interventions were, were associated with these areas. Uh, so, so this was an important insight. Now, the program was rolled out later to a much larger group of uh, clinics. This pilot took place in five RI clinics and, um, and a follow-up experience was published last year. And you see here uh, the kind of data that went into the predictive models here and and there were uh, 54 clinics that were part of what was called the Dialysis Hospitalization Reduction Program and 54 control clinics, right? You see here uh, the patient characteristics and so on and so forth. And most importantly, what you see here is that uh, the hospitalization rate uh, was lower in those clinics with the uh, uh, Dialysis Hospitalization Reduction Program. So this tells us that the information provided is indeed actionable. And this is very, very important to understand. Now, there is, of course, a number of criticisms when it comes to AI. I think one of the, the, the one important criticism is that uh, AI systems provide a sort of black box. Uh, it, AI systems don't allow us to, to clearly understand how does an AI system arrive at a certain decision. Um, and and this, is a, this can be a problem and there is a, a host of regulatory, legal and ethical issues. Second is that AI is in most cases I would say in almost all cases, unable to identify cause link between the input and the output. So, so the, uh, the AI insights are primarily correlational, not causal. Thirdly, there is this lack of inherent creativity. Uh, and uh, it's very difficult what, 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 to, to define creativity, but but uh, just the ability to foresee these phase shifts, for example, this this is what I mean with uh, creativity here. Or then uh, uh, it uses very large data sets. I mean, uh, it doesn't. Uh, so that's important, and that's some criticism here. And and it, it has promised to adapt to previously unknown input data. Now <clears throat> there is. Also, of course, a number of uh, ethical guidelines and the European Union and now late, uh, more recently, the American Food and the US Food and Drug Administration have, have, um, have issued guidelines um, how, to, what, what, how to develop trustworthy artificial intelligence applications. So um, some of the, the, the Governing principles are human agency and oversight, 
that's what I meant earlier when, when I indicated that you as physicians, us as physicians, we're in the driver's seat, we define goals, so elimination and oversight, technical robustness and safety, privacy and data governance, transparency, diversity, really to avoid biases here, non-discrimination and, uh, and fairness, and I'm sorry, uh, non-discrimination and fairness, and actually also the, to, to think about the, uh, the societal implications of, um, of uh, the, the AI applications. Now, most recently, uh, the, uh, and you can see if this is from September this year, the US Food and Drug Administration have issued uh, guidance for industry and um, the FDA staff on, um, on clinician support software, including AI, uh, that's an important step forward. So I'm sorry, I just tried to get rid of this. Well, it's, it's okay. So, okay, uh, when, when I step back and, and look at this, um, at this landscape, I think uh, that what we are observing uh, right now is a confluence of several, uh, what I call here 21st century megatrends. It's, um, it's the whole area of precision medicine and, and uh, multi-omics. So genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, uh, transcriptomics, etc. on one hand, as a, as a huge, very rich data source. On the other hand, we, uh, we have electronic health records that store uh, just tremendous amounts of data about patients. Uh, there's also the ability to capture socioeconomic data or lifestyle data, for example, by going through social media, right? Uh, the number of data from pervasive sensing devices, such as Apple Watch, Fitbit, et cetera, et cetera, will grow rapidly. And it's really the integration of those multimodal data sets through advanced AI, mathematics, network analysis, and other disciplines uh, will bring this information together. And, and this is enabled by the rapid development of um, parallel cloud-based computation. I mean, I, I, I just think back, the first time I personally was dealing uh, and conducting research into artificial intelligence, this was in the early 1990s. And, and I mean, we were so limited by the computational capability of uh, the devices we had. Uh, despite math accelerators, et cetera, et cetera. Nowadays, it's just unbelievable how much computational uh, capability is available, specifically cloud-based. It's, uh, I mean, it's, uh, everything pales in comparison. And, and I'm sure there will be further developments um, in, the, in, the, in the next years uh, to, to, to come. Now, it's really important. This is something I, I, I cannot overemphasize. As physicians, we have an um, important role in this emerging new world. It's very important to maintain a patient-centered perspective. I mean, just really to think why are we using certain tools? It's to the betterment of the patient, right? It's important to protect patients' privacy. It's also to communicate the meaning of, uh, say, AI output, predictions, et cetera, in clear terms to our patients. So we, they can embark on informed decision-making. We are sort of intermediaries between patients and AI experts. In order to do this, we just have to learn uh, and understand uh, the basics of artificial intelligence uh, to play a meaningful role in the future. And it's, that's why I'm so happy that I was invited to this call, uh, to this uh, presentation, because I think it's just important for us to, to stay up to date what's going on here. Otherwise, 
uh, otherwise our role will be greatly diminished and the field is um, will be taken over by by non-medical experts uh, as a summary are the uh, opportunities and concerns well uh, it's in the specifically in the dialysis space uh, AI M machine learning applications are slowly emerging um, there is uh, what, what we did actually um, was in I reached out to data analysts from three large dialysis providers for seniors Medicare Davita and DCI and it showed that only two AI ML driven applications are routinely used, namely linear control and hospitalization prediction applications. Uh, there's regular challenges because of the black box nature we spoke about of AI systems, and uh, it will be really decisions just will be critical uh, in the implementation of AI machine learning. And of course, regulatory uh, regulations regarding AI systems are evolving. Now, Towards the end, I always like uh, to show this where uh, Martin Ries, astrophysical and royal astronomer to the queen, and I guess now to the king, uh, takes a long view where he said, I think artificial intelligence will for decades to come be less of a word than real stupidity. Okay, and we, I want to end with this here. Uh, success is not a straight line. It's a, it's a convoluted process. But I think together and, and with our willingness as physicians to get really engaged in, in these fields, um, success to the betterment of our patients is, uh, will happen. So really, thank you. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Peter. That was a very complex uh, topic that you've tackled very well. And really enlightened a lot of our physicians to whom this is a very new um, concept and a very new area. Um, Dr. Peter, according to, to my understanding, you know, artificial intelligence, it, you know, it'll augment the clinician's work in terms of, you know, diagnostics, prediction, treatment, evaluation eventually. But a lot of it relies on um, electronic medical records. That's and right. um, that's the basis, you know, for prediction. But mm -hmm. in our part of the world, in the developing world, where we don't have a lot of access to, you know, these AMR, then of what benefit or is there any potential for AI in our part of the world where, you know, a lot of our units, our hospitals, they lack this basic EMR. And then, yeah. you know, just to extrapolate on that, that, you know, then what is the generalizability? So maybe if you have data from kidney disease patients in the West, can you really generalize yeah. it yeah. to our mm -hmm. patients on dialysis? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. No, thank you. And uh, Dr. Marine, and this is really good and, and important questions you're asking. So as I said, AI works, uh, uh, when you have a lot of data. And so in the medical field, there may, be, there may be certain areas where AI applications are useful, like with image recognition, right? The, think of the example I gave you about the aneurysm, and there are many other examples like this. So where you do not need an, uh, an electronic health record, but you need a a, a smartphone to take a picture and this is sent to the cloud and there it's analyzed, right? So uh, so I think that there is areas, but obviously to make full use of AI, electronic health records would be important. But they said there are other areas such as image analysis. To what extent are really data ex uh, can, uh, can they be generalized? Uh, it's a, another excellent point. Uh, generally speaking, they cannot be generalized. So uh, it's a very general statement. But uh, what I'm saying is that, say, a prediction model we have developed in the US for our patients cannot be one or one copied and applied in, um, say, in, in, in an East African country. Why not? First, uh, the the parameters you are collecting is different from the parameters the model is using. 
Secondly, the patient characteristics are different. So what's needed is to, uh, to retrain and, and say an artificial neural network with uh, the data from a specific country or region of the world. Now, uh, like the ACM, the NEMA control module I spoke about, when it was implemented in Singapore, I was told it in the first months it just failed, it didn't work. But then they retrained it because it was originally trained with data from Europe. But after they had retrained it, it worked. So, so this is something to keep in mind, but um, these are well-recognized problems and, and you point them out correctly. And, and there is known solutions. I hope this is a helpful answer. Yes, absolutely, Dr. Peter. Yes. And, um, you know, we have another question from Dr. Manjusha, and she asks that, are there any trials that have looked into mortality outcomes between dialysis patients who've been under AI surveillance versus those who haven't? Do we have any data on that? Yeah. An RCT, I don't think so, no. No, I don't think so. It's a very good question. Let me just think for a few more seconds that looked into mortality outcomes. No, I'm pretty sure there aren't. One, wonderful. And then we have Dr. Lloyd, who's um, asking a very interesting question that um, do we have in East Africa, can we use the Western model to develop mm -hmm. our own uh, model with a better fit with training? Yeah, I think so. I think so. And, uh, and this is something where I think there's great opportunities really to work together. Say when, um, when, when you say, okay, there is one fundamental problem you would want to solve. And, um, and then it's, it's a good idea to, to start the conversation and say, hey, maybe we have a solution for that. I mean, the, the, the model would need to be trained with your data, but yeah, that's like, that's just where we have to go through this. Uh, and uh, I'm going just, uh, our eyes going through this process right now as we speak with the group in Thailand. And, uh, and they, they have a very specific problem and we help them uh, to develop a machine learning model uh, to that end. Or we did this with, um, with a group in Taiwan a few years ago. And then this was published and worked uh, very successfully, yes. But again, the important thing is you need to let, you, you need to define the goal, right? And then the question is, uh, do we have the, is there the data for the goal? If the answer is yes, then okay, then uh, let's think about um, an AI model or AI uh, application that can address this. Absolutely. And then finally, Dr. Peter, what do you feel on, um, on, you know, in terms of oversight and, you know, ethical considerations in terms of diagnostics in that who would take, you know, the final responsibility? Because if it's, you know, dependent on yeah. this mm -hmm. computer generated yeah. information. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe you could elaborate on that. Yeah, uh, Dr. Maureen, that's just another profound and excellent question. In my mind, AI is just a tool. It's a tool like the lab, right? It's a tool like the X-ray machine. And uh, at the end of the day, it's the physician who has taken responsibility. That's my firm belief. It's, uh, it's the physician who takes care of the patient. Uh, I know there is people who have other opinions on that would rather want to distribute the responsibility about uh, across many, many stakeholders. But, but you, us as physicians who really take care of the patient, but we have to make the, uh, to make the final call here and say, look, uh, based on all we know, the prognosis is this and that. So that's why it's so important to integrate these insights. I don't know if this was helpful, but uh... yes, absolutely, absolutely. That that really clarified on that. I and I, I mean, I had been told we should stop at eight, but I've seen there's two more questions as well. Sure. If I could just 
um, quickly go through them that um, are there any models that predict graft outcomes of vulnerability for infections? Uh, you mean transplant graft outcomes? Yes, yes, transplant. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me think. I don't recall one from the top of my head, I have to say, but it's an area where I didn't conduct any research in, so I may not be up to date with the literature. It's worthwhile just go to PubMed and perform a quick search. Wonderful, Dr. Peter. I really appreciate that uh, you've taken out your time to be with us on this fireside chat and um, opened up our minds to the possibilities of artificial intelligence. Um, it's been a really wonderful talk and the uh, audience has really appreciated it. And so do we here at uh, Africa Healthcare Network. We do look forward uh, to having you know, more sessions with you Hopefully at the rate at which artificial intelligence is going, I really hope the next time we invite you, it might not be a robot sitting in for you, but we've really, really appreciated it. Thank you so much for your time. And on behalf of the entire team, thank you very much. No, thank you. And I really appreciate your interest. And I hope that uh, the relationship with the African Healthcare Network will get closer as we uh, discuss uh, partnerships with with Mondo and others and I'm always more than happy to come back to this group with with presentations I greatly greatly enjoy being with you so really thank you all and have a good remainder of the day thank you thank you so much thank Peter. you I mean I think you all have so many good models actually that we should look into like your fluid status your prediction of mortality and there is also other models that I can see prediction of CKD progression and the higher risk, the intermediate yeah. risk, the lowest. This is problem. exactly the project we are working on currently with a group in Thailand, okay. prediction of CKD progression. Okay. Not easy because uh, there are many, many aspects are not that well documented in electronic health records, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. All thank right. you all. Be all right, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Professor Katanka. Thank bye you bye. very much. Yeah. Bye-bye.